That, that's me, your lighthearted host and expressionist. And this, this is my podcast, Love and Lies. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with, what are we going to call you? Abel. Abel. Okay. <laughs> you would pick that name. Um, this is the lawyer that has been practicing for 45 years law. And when I first met you, the reason why I wanted to interview you is because when I first met you, uh, I had a question for you and then it went into a whole long conversation. And uh, I'm glad I took notes that day, but you are a divorce lawyer and, and you've been doing that on and off for uh, divorce is a small part of my practice mostly I do trial work it just so happens that I do family laws part of what I do all right so the reason why I wanted to interview you is when you and I first met um, and I learned how many divorces you have handled over the course of the years I asked you a question and it was out of just pure curiosity. And it was, if you still believed in marriage. And I answered yes. And you answered yes. I haven't changed my opinion since I gave you that answer. And that has shocked me. It shocked me. <laughs> Why? Because I would think that you would be jaded. I mean, it, even people that have been married a couple of times are a little bit jaded. Uh, when you talk about marriage yeah. and you've been exposed and seen it all. I've seen it all. At least I thought I've seen it all. Every day is something new and something different and something more shocking in a lot of ways. But I see my role in what I do in the family law area maybe is different. And so it does not jade me at all. Um, you've been married a couple of times yourself. Twice. Twice, so divorce twice. Yes. What, in your opinion, what happened with your marriage? Is well, it typical with what happens to everybody else? Do you see anything that's like a common? I don't think my two divorces, which were, I called them in my prior life, but I, I think I was pretty common uh, in that world of being a kind of a benign husband. I went to, got up every day and went to work and came home and brought work home every night and sat and did my work until I fell asleep and my wife became a second-class citizen to my job and ultimately my kids. And when you allow that to happen, your marriage is destined to fail and I had two of them that did exactly that. Is this something that people complain about? When you see them come in, they're filing for a divorce and you see this ongoing like an on. No. That you said I'm going to end up like them if I don't? No. I, most, uh, well, most of what I see when people come in for divorce, and this is, a, this is not a universal truth, is stuff that's way more ugly than just not learning how to communicate with your spouse and not treating your spouse as number one in your, in your life. Most of them come in with abuse in one form or another, whether it's emotional or whether it's physical. Um, people come in because they're having affairs with other people. It's not often you get somebody that comes in and says, I want to get divorced because my husband, my husband just doesn't listen to me or my wife just doesn't listen to me. That's, yeah, but that's, that's where you rare. grow apart though. And that's where all the other things come in, such as affairs and... Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that... Um, well, those things may happen anyway. I think when people aren't being satisfied with their home life, I think that those things are more likely to creep in. Um, you mentioned also that when you were dating your wife, everything was great, and then you got married. I was a great date and a lousy husband, I think. So Really? Yeah. Yeah. So what made you stop being a great date once you got married? You know, I wish I could give you a good answer because I, I psychologically, I don't have an answer. I can't explain why when I go out with somebody or when I was in the dating world, I 
was always loving, kind, and respectful. And I got married. I didn't stop being loving, kind, and respectful. I just didn't put my wife at the top of my priority list. And isn't that typical? I think that's typical. I think a lot of men listening can identify with what you just said. Because is it because, let me ask you this, is it because she no longer needs to be chased? Men are hunters and they like to hunt. And then all of a sudden now she's the wife and she's got this title of mom. And now do you, is there loss of attraction or is it just that you're not chasing you're a little bit confident, comfortable. Yeah, I, I think without having thought about it back then, but I think that it works both ways too with women. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that the chase has a lot to do with what keeps the fire going. And I think that when you get married, you no longer have to chase and therefore you stop thinking about what it takes to keep a relationship going over a long period of time. I totally agree with what you're saying. So, you know, and, and, and again, this is not just a guy thing, but I think it's been primarily our role in life to be the breadwinners. Uh, we go out and work, and when you're in the profession like I'm in, there's no end to the amount of hours that you could spend working. I have deadlines. I have pressure every day and every night. I can't remember a night in my 47 years that I didn't take work home. I didn't always do it. I don't remember going on a vacation without taking work with me on vacations my whole career. And this is with like loving what it is that you do. Well, you know, again, I'm not sure that I thought about how much I love my work. I was just a busy guy and I just got a lot of work and I had deadlines and I had to do it and I enjoyed what I do. But my attitude and justification for what I'm doing is different today than it was 47 years ago. So if she actually still was, um, if you still had to chase her, if you still had to hunt, that would have changed things in your marriage, you think, and well, vice versa? I, I think it absolutely would have for two reasons. One, I think that that chase is part of sort of what makes our blood race. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I, I think I would have spent more time in the chase than working. And once you get married, you don't have to chase, and therefore you can devote more time to working than trying to satisfy your mate. Me personally, I am, you know, I've had my experiences in life, and this interview is about you, not me, but. Um, I have pretty much settled that I really always want to feel like a woman and it's for those reasons. I don't want to be this, I don't want to have this title of a wife necessarily and this title of a mother and anything else. I think that where I feel most feminine and I think that helps in my in relationships, I've, you know, I've been divorced. Um, and so we're all learning, but there is something I think about not for women and men, not just being a husband, but still creating that fun atmosphere and, and relationship, right? Um, for sure. I, th I think if we didn't call each other husband and wife and we called each other boyfriend and girlfriend, relationships would probably last a lot longer. I think so too. Right. Um, where where is it that you still believe in marriage after your fail after your two failed marriages and well I wouldn't necessarily call them failed because how long did they last? First one was about thirteen years and the second one was twenty two. Okay, so that's successful, correct? Well, um, I would think uh, up to a point. I think any time a marriage fails, it's hard to say it's successful. But still, it's twenty two years that you wouldn't go back and change i mean that's 20 that's a long time well it's 35, that's a successful 35 run at it. yeah 35 years of my adult life but i don't begrudge a minute of it uh, and as i said to you the first time we met i would do it again in a heartbeat i know and that shocked me yeah. i've always been i think a relationship guy you know i've never really enjoyed dating and dating around 
So I kind of think I still have that same mindset. Um, and uh, whether I've learned anything from my first two marriages or not, I can't tell you until I do it again. So you would marry instead of knowing that you're a better boyfriend than a husband, you would still step into the role as a husband? Absolutely. Because? Because I believe in the institution. I believe that if you're going to be with somebody emotionally and physically, that um, you're supposed to be married, and I believe that. And what would you do different? What do you say? What would you say right out the door? This is what I would do different. Not uh, bring work home. Um, create date night. Make sure the communication was there. Well, certainly uh, try not to bring work home. It's probably impossible to think that that could happen mm -hmm. every day, but mm -hmm. not to bring work home, to make sure that my first priority in life was to uh, ask uh, what I can do to make my wife's day better. I went to a, a Bible study for a number of years, and the... Um, the minister that ran it, who was a great, great guy, just died recently, um, said the perfect marriage is when the husband wakes up in the morning and says to his wife, what can I do to make your life better and your day better? And she wakes up in the morning and says, what can I do to make your day better? In other words, it's not about you. It's about the other person. And the minute you can take yourself and your ego and your self-centeredness mm -hmm. out of the relationship, it will work. The, um, I have in here, I definitely want to ask you about ego because I think that's where a lot of divorces actually start in the home before you actually end up in the divorce court. But the ego is definitely something that plays a part. Uh, I have a lot of people always say to me that they've got, they know exactly what they want in the other person and who they're looking for. And I always reply, I know you're laughing. I'm like, so who are you? What are you, what are you going to be? How are you going to be able to maintain and keep this person happy? You've got this long list of everything it is that you're looking for, but, you know, you're a mess. And what are you going to be able to give this person? What is this person going to be able to get from you? What are you going to give them? And people don't look at it like that. They're so focused on what the other person needs to bring to the table. Well, it's because we all think we're perfect and that everybody should just want to be with us. And so it's about what they can bring to the table, not what we can offer them. I used to think like that. <laughs> I did used to think like that. I would look over and I would think you're just lucky to, to be sitting right there. And uh, obviously that was ego and um, those, those relationships didn't work out. <laughs> They did chase me right out the door. <laughs> yeah. I, I took off. Um, that's the other thing. I've kind of, I've, um, I've always known when I was going, I've always known I would leave every man that I was with. I always knew in the beginning that I would leave every man that I was in a relationship with. It's a bad way to walk marriage. into a relationship, but I it understand. Is. Do you understand that? Is that, sure. is that real? Because I think that you try, but I think in the back of my mind, I just know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outgrow them. I'm, I'm truly, really not in the love that I want to be in and that maybe the love that I want doesn't exist out there. And so you kind of start working with what you have and you enjoy their person. You know, you love them, you have feelings or whatever, but to have that ultimate love, you just sometimes think that it's not out there and... And I think um, I've always known, it's not that I think, I know that I've always known that I would leave everybody that I was with. Well, my guess is that that comes from something way back in your past life that's created that type of an attitude walking into a relationship. Because well, if you walk in with that relationship, it will be that. Well, I saw my mother leave and she showed me how to do it. And... Um, I, I never, you know, when I do coaching with people, I ask them, what were you taught love was or is? And it stumps everybody because they don't realize, and they're, they say, oh, I was taught that love was pain or love was I'm sorry, or love was, you know, whatever. But, it, but they're never really taught. What were you taught love was? I, I was never taught what love was. I mean, and I don't think... 
that I know very many people, if anybody, that sits down and teaches their children outside of um, faith, outside of a religious idea of what true love really is. I, I don't think that we sit down and talk to our kids about love is. I think we either model it or we don't. Well, if we're modeling it, then that's what we're taught love is. And so if we see this shitty marriage, this, this relationship, whatever's going on in our childhood, that is what we're taught love is. And we're preconditioned before we go out and start dating and marrying people that this is what... Well, I, I think that you go one of two ways. I think when you're involved in, as a child in a lousy relationship, one of two things will happen. You'll either model that lousy relationship and you will continue to have lousy relationships as an adult or you do the exact opposite and you'll say, I don't want to be like that. And you will have a great relationship. People go one or the I still other don't know. I still don't think people still know what they're doing when they say they're going to have a great relationship because ego and everything comes into play. There's so many other different circumstances but and situations to, that come in. But you have to take it a day at a time. I mean, there's no, you know, you can read all the books in the world, mm -hmm. but because you walk into a relationship and everybody has their own past and everybody has their own psychological makeup, mm -hmm. everybody has their own predisposition to do certain things or not to do certain things. And the key is to be able to figure out how you can make your background and your psychological makeup fit with the person on the other side that you're going to marry. And, you know, you can look at it going in, and if it doesn't work, don't go in in the first place. But if you're going to go into it, you know, make sure that you're committed to figure out how to make it work. Marriage is work. And if you really want to have something special that unfortunately in today's world not very many people have then you'll wake up every day and say this is my number one priority and what do i need to do to make today a better day for my spouse because the ego then at that point is really not there it's about the other person it's not about you whenever it's about you it ain't going anywhere it ain't going anywhere right what is the worst uh, divorce case you've handled Actually, the, probably the worst case that I handled was not a divorce case. It was a post-divorce case that involved um, child alienation. And so to me, the worst divorce cases are not what the adults do to each other because they're adults. And if they want to beat each other up and punish each other and be miserable to each other, you know, post-divorce or even during the divorce, then they're adults and they've got the right to do it. But it's when what the adults do that affect children who have no clue as to what's going on other than the, their world, their security is being torn apart. That's the bad part of divorce. And the worst case was one that went on for many, many years post-divorce and involved a couple of children that were badly scarred by what happened post-divorce. Okay, so we know a lot of people that are listening in the middle of a divorce right now, I'm sure. Statistically? Statistically. Probably 60 or 70%. Right. So if that's out there, if you're out there, what would you have, what would you say to that person right now that might be using the kids in this tug of war that might just rattle their consciousness and have them stop and rethink about what they're getting ready to do or what they could possibly change? That's a, that's a great question because I have this conversation with almost everybody that comes into my office that has children and I sort of warn them that if they want to use their children to gain some advantage in this divorce that they've got the wrong guy to represent them. Uh, and I think that if a parent would understand that children see their mother and their father as their security. It's not the size of their house and it's not the car that they drive and it's not the toys that they buy them. It's that their mother and their father are together. And that if you're going to tear that relationship apart, you need to understand that you're really tearing the fabric of these kids apart. And, and what's even worse is that you then expect a child of 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, to live in two households in today's world 50% of the time, which is the norm. So they live in two different households. They got to go to mom's house and they got to go to dad's house. And they got to figure out how they're supposed to deal with mom and then go to dad's house and figure out how they're supposed to deal with dad. And most times they have different parenting styles. And you expect a five, six, seven, eight year old brain to figure out how to process two completely different worlds and grow up as a normal functioning adult. And it doesn't happen. These kids are scarred for life. There was a study done, I think around the latter part of the 90s or early 2000s that kind of set the psychological world on its ear where I think it was a British study that followed about 150 families from divorce through adulthood. And in every circumstance but one, the children were worse off because of the divorce. And the only time the children were better off is when there was abuse. And the minute you took the abuse out of the relationship, the abuse against the kids, they, they got better. But every other circumstance, the children did worse. They had more After d- divorce. So unless it was, so what he's saying is, is unless it was a case about abuse, normal, um, you know, homes that are dysfunctional and um, unhappy, the children were better off in that environment versus being divorced, coming from a divorced family, trying to survive and live between two families, which he's not saying stay in your unhappy marriage and with all that stuff, but, or are you? Well, what are you saying? There's (laughs) there's a different spin on the the same comment that you made. And that is not necessarily to stay in an unhappy marriage, but fix it. Yeah, fix it. Work on it. Figure out if it's possible to save it. Because the most important thing you have in the relationship, if you have children, is those children. Mm -hmm. Get over yourself. Yes. Get over your unhappiness. Get over what you think the other guy does. He, he, whatever, he doesn't wipe his face after he eats chocolate ice cream or whatever bothers you about him. Because what you're ignoring is what the effect on your children is going to be when you decide you're going to leave. What about if you're completely, totally unhappy with that person and you're miserable and you're staying in the marriage for the children? What happens then that the children are now are learning in this environment that this is what love is? Well, it's a bad example for the children. It gives them a bad example of what a good marriage should be. Whether or not it's better than a good divorce, I can't answer that question. I don't know. But I would say that you can be in an unhappy in a marriage and do your best to fix it. And sometimes you have to learn how to survive in a relationship that isn't perfect, maybe bad, all by your lonesome. Mm-hmm. And you still may be, I'm not saying you are, but maybe better off than in a divorce. Again, I don't think that in all circumstances we should stay together as a married couple when it's really awful. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it, you might be better off to, to be divorced. The problem is that we live in a world that says, if you're not happy, get out. Everything's disposable. Everything is disposable. Everything is, we live in a world of fast food. And, and if our internet takes more than one, one hundredth of a second to give us an answer to a Google search, we're miserable. And, you know, when we treat our marriages the same way, you go to most marriage counselors and you tell them how unhappy you are. And they say, what are you doing? Get divorced. And, and that's wrong. I still think a lot of our problems in marriages stem from ego. I think a lot of our problems in life stem from ego. I think if we took the we ego really walked backwards. If you took the ego out of it, if you do what my comment was earlier, what this minister had to say, and that is you make it about the other person and not about you, you'll look at the world of marriage and children and all that much, much, much different than most people do. 
I never lived like that before in relationships. I wasn't taught that. I'm a different person today. I've learned a lot, but um, I, I, I've never really functioned in a relationship where I thought, well, because again, I always thought I would be leaving. Well, they, they have, in today's world, they, uh, have, they have premarital counseling. Uh, does that work? Well, I can't tell you whether. Because you're happy in love at that point. Yeah. And you're just like, well, let's discuss how this is going to go and that's going to go and everybody's agreeable. And then all of a sudden. Mm, I think premarital counseling is really designed to tell you that it's not always going to be perfect. Marriages go up and marriages go down. Marriages are not level. Marriages don't always travel in an upward line. And if you're not prepared to think about what you're going to do when it isn't so good, then you're going to fail because the minute it's lousy, you're going to listen to what the world tells you. And that is, if you're not happy, get out. What is the, um, the marriage counseling that they require you to do before you divorce? What is that called legally? It's, uh, it's, they call it a parent information program. And the purpose of it is designed to tell you how to be good divorced parents. Primarily, okay. this is good. Yeah, primarily they try and tell you how not to screw up your kids any worse than you've already done <laughs> um, post divorce. And when you continue to harbor bitterness towards your ex husband or your ex wife, your children hear and see absolutely uh, everything. Do. If you think they don't aren't holding a glass up to your bedroom door while you're telling your <laughs> girlfriends what a piece of garbage your ex husband is, you'd be very wrong. So, you know, you gotta, when it's over, it's over. And if that's what the two of you choose to do and you get a divorce, then at least be respectful to each other for the benefit of your children. You don't have to love each other. You don't even have to want to sit in the same table at a wedding, you know, in the same, you know, room. But be respectful when you're dealing with your ex uh, in relation to in relationship to your children, you, your divorce doesn't end your relationship with your spouse. Right. When, when you have children, it's that forever. that relationship goes on forever. forever you've, got, ever. you've got graduations, and you've got marriages, and you've got children, and you've got grandchildren, and you've got birthdays, and you're always going to have a need to be in the same room with your ex, and you can make it miserable. For you, your ex, and your children, or you can make it great. I never heard my mother talk bad about my father. Well, that's a wonderful thing. Isn't it? It is a wonderful thing. I don't know where she learned that from, but she, I never ever heard her speak negatively. Are your parents married or divorced? My parents uh, are dead. Are dead, okay. But they were, um, they were married until my father died, and then... 25 years later, my mother died, but um, they were married, but it was a rocky, rocky road. I'm not sure that if my father uh, didn't die from a car accident, I'm not sure that my parents would have stayed together based on my perception at age 12 or 13. Your mother would have killed them. <laughs> no, my mother was a very small lady, so I don't think she would have. It might have poisoned him. But I, <laughs> But no, they didn't have a, uh, it wasn't a model marital relationship for me. So quickly, I have to ask, did you, anything from your childhood that you witnessed in their marriage, did you see repeat in your own? Did, did dad bring work home? Was, do you see? No, okay. no, my dad was a guy that just went to work and came home. And right. I kind of I sit back and I've said this to at least a couple of people that I envy the guy that, works at McDonald's and I don't mean to demean that job because every job in this world today is important. Absolutely. But I envy the guy that can go home at the end of his eight hour day and have nothing on his mind, but dealing with his family. Uh, right. He doesn't have to think about how many hamburgers he's got to have on the grill by eight o'clock in the morning. He doesn't worry about how much money the store is bringing in. Right. During the course of the day, he doesn't have to do any of that. He can just Be content. come home and deal with his wife and children. And I envy that. You know what? 
I do too. Because my life's pretty complicated. Your life's pretty complicated. And lots of times I sit there and think, why can't I just be content with and have a very simple life? Because I think it, it's I think a, it'd be so much easier. <laughs> it's a nice, there's a little book out there called The Red Sea Rule. I was going to ask you about yes. that. And, and I, somebody gave it to me, and it's a real tiny little book. Uh, and I only read Red Sea Rule number one. I never read the other nine. Okay. Because Red, <laughs> that Red, was sea, enough. Red Sea Rule number one says that God has you exactly where he wants you at the moment. And I'm a firm believer in that. And so I'm a firm believer that I am at this moment exactly where I'm supposed to be. Okay. For the listeners, he's mentioned God a couple of times. And he was not this Christian man that's standing in front of me today that I know I've met you this way. You were not like that. You were well, I'm sitting. So. We're sitting. <laughs> but he he was not like that. So um you've definitely had um your fun and and a, a life pass or, or without God you keep on bringing it up. So I don't want people to think that you're perfect or think that you're perfect. Uh you mentioned earlier We'll get back to the God thing, but you mentioned earlier a good divorce. What's a good divorce? Well, to the extent the divorce has to happen, I think that a good divorce is where people can walk away from the table, respecting the other person, respecting their differences, because that's what generally causes the divorce and will come together every time it's necessary for the benefit of their children if they have children. It doesn't always have to be about money and property. Um, many, 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 many divorces, there isn't enough money and property to justify uh, hiring a lawyer to handle your divorce. It should really never be about that. It should be about uh, raising your children in a divorced environment in the healthiest possible way that you can. So really, you're saying that once you know that you're going to divorce, then accept it, move past it, get over yourself. Really, divorce is really about the children. It's not about, it shouldn't be about anything else, but, but that's, making that's your my, life up so that the children yeah. are supported, period. That's my perfect world, which doesn't exist. But if you're asking me, that would be a, a good divorce, but there are very few of them. I happen to believe that that I've actually had two of them that I would call good divorces. I am still friends with my ex-wives. We do, one of them lives out of town, one of them lives here. We do birthdays, Mother's Day, Father's Day. We do everything as a family, whether there's somebody else involved in one of our lives or not. Uh, and I remember I was sitting, I was in my kitchen. Actually, I was in my ex-wife's kitchen uh, one afternoon, and my kids were there, and they were talking. My one daughter was talking about one of her friends and how when she goes to her mom's house and she can't tell her mom what happens at her dad's house, mm -hmm. and she goes to her dad's house and she can't talk about her mom because they hate each other. And my, my kids looked at me and said, you, but you guys actually get along. And that's what they've seen. That's not to say there haven't been issues that were probably created in their minds because of the divorce that I wish didn't have to happen. I will tell you that had I thought about it at the time that the divorces were taking place, I would have, were it up to me, would not have gotten divorced. Um, but so I've practiced that in my life. I like to try and communicate that to my clients. But People only hear what they want to hear. Okay, so I want to ask you, who filed for the divorces with your wives? Um, I was on the top end of my first one and the bottom end of my second one. Okay. So your message is you fucked up your marriage, don't fuck up your children. If you're going to screw up your marriage, don't screw up your children, if you can help it. I mean, there's no way to avoid some damage. Right but make it as good as you can make it. There is a meme that I read once that said, drugs will get you high, but parents will fuck you up. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't believe that. It's not universal in either case. Okay, so have you seen any marriages stop like in the middle of um, you handling the divorce and they said, you know what, we're just we're we're still in love and we just made up? I mean, have you seen couples kind of like stop and try and save their marriage in the middle of some divorce but court? It's, but it's rare, and uh, and unfortunately in a percentage of those cases where the people do reconcile a couple of years later, they're back. But it's not universal. There are some that do reconcile. I respect that. In fact, I encourage that. I, I have a couple that are a client of mine that decides to reconcile. Typically, I write off the rest of their bill Aww. as a reconciliation present. Nice. Because so. you believe in love and you believe in marriage. Yes. Has anybody ever divorced, remarried again with that same person that they divorced and then come back through going through the a second divorce? Yes. A couple Gosh, of, really? Yeah, a couple of times. I've had I've had a couple of them where they got married to each other a second time. I can't remember whether I had one that actually went a third time. But uh, it does happen. That's bizarre. I yeah. didn't think that that was. Um, what about prenups? Let's talk about that. Donald Trump is huge on prenups. Um, what do you think? When should you file a prenup? He, everybody should file a prenup when it. When it no, I, I don't think so at all. Um, I think prenups have a place typically when it's a later in life marriage where one of the parties has worked and accumulated, you know, a reasonable estate and has children and he's amassed what he's done typically for the benefit of his children. Uh, and so when he's coming in and, and remarrying, oftentimes it's with, and, and again, I know this is not going to sound right, but it's, it's more okay. often You're than anonymous. not. <laughs> more often than not, it's an older guy and a younger woman. Okay, okay, we're going to talk about that, too, because so, that's juicy. Okay, so, go ahead. But a, but a prenup should protect not only the estate of the person who's accumulated more, and sometimes it's not always the guy, and sometimes the parties are relatively equal in terms of what they accumulated, but it does need to sort of predict the future and say, what what happens if? I mean, if we're married for 10 years, you know, because the typical prenup walking in says, you keep what you got, I keep what I got. If we get divorced, you walk out with what you walked in with, and I walk out with what, and that's not always the right thing to do, and it's not always fair, particularly when there's a disparity in assets and a disparity in income during the course of the marriage. So, I mean, a good lawyer will take a look and and try and predict the future and, and convince the party that's got the assets and the money that given a length of marriage, there needs to be some consideration if the marriage doesn't work out or if somebody dies. So you get to a prenup can be looked at like, okay, we already know if this comes to that point, what the end result is going to be. Yes. Do you think that it um, kind of forces people or encourages people to work on their marriage if they feel like they're going to get not so good. <laughs> it's, it's funny. It, 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 it could have either effect, uh -huh. and, and that is that it could force somebody to want to behave and stay uh -huh. longer in a marriage because of what they may give up if they get divorced. Be SOL. On the other hand, I've seen at least one case where there were milestones for what the wife would get if they stayed married for a long enough period of time. And one of the parties made sure... Like incentives? Yes. One of the parties made sure that one of the milestones did not happen. In other words, filed for divorce before oh, wow. okay. the end of the next milestone because he didn't want to pay what the next milestone was going to cost him. Okay. So was that a relationship based off of money or was that they just got tired of each other but at that point and he was like, hell no, she's not going to get this. What was that about? Should women mm. feel, um, women or men, should anyone feel um, uncomfortable when a prenup is brought up? 
how should they start looking at it? I, I think there is a, a reason. Like offended. Yes, I think there is a reason to be offended um, okay. and a reason not to be offended. All right. Um, and I can only tell you, I don't do tons of prenup, um, uh, but I had one, you know, where the where the gal came in and they were both, she was younger than he was, but it wasn't like an older guy and a younger woman. There was an age difference, but not huge. He'd established a business, um, but he didn't really want, he wanted everything that was his was his forever, and yet he wanted to have more children, and he wanted her to be the primary caregiver for his children by his former marriage, and he wasn't putting anything on the table to justify putting her in that position. So she had a reason to, to be offended. Um, uh, you know, you never want to, it's not my job to be judgmental and it's mm -hmm. not my job to do anything other than to tell people what's going to happen if, you know, but in this case, it was really hard for me to bite my tongue and say, do you really want to do this? And under circumstances like that, where the prenup was offensive because it didn't really make provisions for what his expectations were of the person that was about to be his wife. And again, this sounds like you're also teetering towards it's more for being able to carry out what you have established in life for your children so that somebody doesn't come in for yourself too, but yeah. to make sure that the children, that they would benefit from any kind of death yeah, or anything well, like that. Every circumstance is different. There's no universal truth here. There's no universal answer as to what's right or wrong in a prenup. I think you simply have to take a look at the circumstances of the two parties, what their expectations are, uh, and decide um, what's fair. If you have two wealthy people, then they're agreeable to a prenup. If you got two people that are that have enough assets that whether they're married or divorced, they're capable of taking care of themselves and their families, then the type of prenup that says you keep what you got, I keep what I got, there's no spousal maintenance if we get divorced because neither of us need it and we just go our own way. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not the typical situation, but there's nothing wrong with that. A divorce attorney um, once told me that if you're going to leave and file for divorce, that you take the pots and pans that you want, or you're going to spend a lot of money fighting for the pots and pans. Like people make materialistic things a big part of the battle and that they're spending you know, thousands of dollars on a set of pots and pans or something that's materialistic that doesn't, so it's bypassing the value, but now there's just this struggle back and forth. Well, you can so take, if you're going to leave, take, take what it is that you want to leave and have the other person have to fight and spend the money to get it back. Well, <laughs> I, I, suppose, I suppose that there's nothing wrong with the advice. The better, really? The better advice is, don't make the divorce about the pots and the pans. If he wants them or she wants them, give it to him. Don't argue about it. Um, so I think that this is the perfect time to start talking about love. But, um, and I'll just, I have a question. Uh, I have a friend that actually went through a pretty high profile type of divorce. And in the end, she took her lawyer home and had sex with him. During the course of the divorce, uh, or after, after it was over right when it home. was done, she took him home. Actually, back to his office. Yeah, was and that, they, and they was had that sex in lieu of the, his fee? <laughs> <laughs> she said it was just so hot that she knew that she was over here doing this, and that that's what they were, and that the ex-husband was sitting over mm -hmm. there on the other side of the courtroom, and that's revenge, sex. What is that? Does that go on? I'm going to ask you. Does it go on? I can't speak from personal experience because that's never happened to me. That's never happened to you? Never happened to me. Um, in the good old days, I think that there was probably a lot more of that that goes on um, even during the course of the divorce proceedings. Right. Arizona never had an ethical rule that prohibited um sex between a lawyer and a client during the course of a proceeding. But um, really, yeah, but a couple of years ago, maybe a little more now, um, we Arizona adopted the 
sort of model ABA rule, which now prohibits a lawyer from having um, a sexual relationship with a client unless they had such a relationship before the div before the engagement started. So if you were there before, you don't have to stop, but otherwise you have to stop until it's over and done with and you terminate your relationship with your client, usually at the end of the proceedings, and then you can do what you want to do. So this is pretty, I'm, I'm thinking this is common in one way, well, regardless of what the law is, whatever the... I, I, you know, I can't tell you what's common because I don't ask any other lawyer how often or whether are lawyers walking down the halls looking at these ex-wives going hmm i that would be a natural male response i know she's <laughs> as, single <laughs> as as it might be for the woman on the other side because when divorces are done you know guys and women you know they go one of two ways either they've it's been so miserable that all they want to do is lock themselves in their room or they decide that they need love and affection that they weren't getting and they go chase it down anywhere they can get it. And so why not start off with... Start with your, start with lawyer? your lawyer. That's a bad, that's a bad <laughs> thing. That's a really, really bad thing. Oh, I think that's we, awesome. we as We as lawyers, quite frankly, should never allow that to happen. I know, but guilty i'm sure not me not you <laughs> <laughs> i may be guilty of a lot of things but not that <laughs> okay so another thing that you and i have in common was that we both like dating younger people do you remember this conversation that we had yes i warned you against it <laughs> <laughs> i can't help it <laughs> I can't help it. Because younger guys are so immature. No, they're not. <laughs> they're fun. They're fast. And they're, you know, I don't know. It's just something about them. Where I think older men, not you, oh, sure. <laughs> are ready to just like settle down, retire, not go out of the house. You know, they want to watch TV and and I don't know. There's something about that with me where younger men to me, you can still yeah. learn with them. And, you know. It's a very unfair characterization of older men. No. <laughs> but no, hold on. <laughs> you like younger women. Why do you like younger women? Because I do not, per I cannot perceive of myself as my age. I have never sort of grown up beyond. Do we want to tell people your age? No, but okay. I've never grown up. You know, around probably beyond, you know, 35, you know, maybe 40 at the outside. And so what I say to people is, you know, the age group of women that, have, that attracts me is the same as it's been for the last 20 or 25 years, but I'm 25 years older. So wait a minute. So, so did you ever date older? Were your wives... Same my, age, I my, bet you. My first wife was the same age, okay. and my second wife was younger. Okay. What's the age difference? About 16 years. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also mentioned something about um, older men being able to provide something for younger women, or wealthier men being able to provide something for women that younger men or not so wealthy um, and that is the security and vacations well I think security I don't, I don't know about vacations but well I mean experiences that yeah. somebody who doesn't have a lot of money can't travel around and create these experiences for the woman yeah it wouldn't and make sense to me if part of the attraction between a younger woman and an older guy for the younger woman is security I, and I personally don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that would be a, a natural and maybe even appropriate expectation. Is that what older men dating younger women, that's their confidence is that they know that they can provide security for this woman and they use that as an advantage? Is that where their confidence is? Uh, I, I think it's... Because now you're, now you're probably attracting women who are looking for security at that point. I think that that is probably true. But again, I haven't done a study and talked to a lot of older men 
who had dated or married younger woman and asked them what was going through their brain when they went through that process. So, but all I can tell you is probably from my own, you know, experiences that I understand that that's part of the deal. And um, as much as I would like to think in the pure sense of, you know, two people falling in love with each other, that it shouldn't be about security, but I don't think I can be stupid enough to assume that there isn't some, um, some part of it that deals with what an older person usually can provide. So there's a younger man and an older man standing next to each other and an attractive woman and the older man standing there saying I can, his confidence or what he would be able to offer is security. And then the other guy would be offering excitement. Excitement. I had, um, I, so the answer is what would the younger woman do? Well, the answer is she would take both of them. Yeah, she would. Okay. At the same time. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. But I'm joking. I, I had a, a, a I've lady. I've done that. A lady that, <laughs> but I understand the, you know, the viewpoint, and that is that sometimes you can't have both sides of it when we would love to have our cake and eat it too. We'd love to have financial security and have the person, you know, race our engine, you know, 24 seven. So I think that um, as the type of woman that I am, my needs are different than somebody who needs that security from a man, that type of security. Otherwise and, you wouldn't be dating younger guys, right? Otherwise I wouldn't be dating. Cause if I can take care of myself, and I have that confidence and that's what it is that I do. And I'm not looking for a man to come in and save me or to take care of me. Then my needs are completely different. For me, it's more about the relationship. and It's a better way to be. The, the problem, and when I say problem, it's the wrong word. It is always the idea of trying to take yourself and put yourself in the second chair and your spouse in the first mm -hmm. chair. And, you know, when you're self-confident and you have, provide for yourself and you don't need the other person, you have to take a look and say, but are you in this relationship giving that other person 100% uh, in order to make the relationship work? Or are you in it saying, hey, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter to me because you can be replaced. Uh, you can be replaced and I can take care of myself without you. And you know what? That's another thing that you mentioned to me that I will never forget. You said to me that, uh, because I told you that a lot of men were intimidated by me, and you said a lot of men, even wealthier men, are intimidated by an independent woman, and that is because you can walk out the door and be just fine. Well, that's... Certainly they don't like that. It's control that correct. men want over women for I, security reasons. It's a, it is a, I think it's a control issue. And again, I don't want to be judgmental and I don't want to be universal mm -hmm. because nothing is universal. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, there's probably a sense that older guys get what they want and they don't want somebody that is going to be independent and give them a hard time and not be there when they want them to be there because their ego is telling them they're the provider mm -hmm. and therefore you should be subservient. And I mean, that's why I can't do it. I can't do it. But not everybody is like that. But the majority I have not met at the majority of them are though. Well, but that means that there's a minority that are dance. Well, it, it can be. I think it's just recognizing early on and walking into a, a relationship early on, whether it's the kind of relationship that can be a mutual two-way street. And if you are dating somebody and they're controlling and they tell you what to wear and what to do and don't respect your opinion, don't hang around very long. But if you got somebody that says, you know, what do you want to do? You know, what's going to make you happy today? You know, where would you like to go? Um, you know, those, there's, those are out there. I'm there right now in my life. 
I mean, I have messed up my relationships probably on purpose. You know, my intentions were completely different. They were, I could go back and and tell you from the beginning what my intentions were with each one of them. Um, I, we know what we're what we're thinking, what our intentions are with other people, and we're always learning. It's a process, but I'm glad to say that I'm at a point in my life where I really just want to be able to give and make somebody happy versus it being about me. Mm -hmm. I'm over myself. Yeah, where your where your thought process is is what you will give to a relationship. I still have to. I have to be a chase. Oh, there's, and I know there's, that's nothing, not. there's nothing wrong <laughs> with a chase, and there's nothing wrong with excitement in a relationship that comes from that. It's whether or not everything else fits. Whether or not the intellectually, uh, materialistically, psychologically, spiritually, you're on the same page. Because if all those other things look like they're going to work, the chase just is the, is, there. is the cherry on the top. The chase is the journey together, and but it, but it sometimes it takes the chase going in to get the attraction. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a, a, a client of mine. I still want to be chased. I know. But and, what about what and about? We all do. It's a it's a it great. It, you know, it's ego, but there but there's nothing wrong with that kind of. It feels good to have somebody say to you how much they want you. Yeah, I mean, I want to chase, and I want to be chased, and I want it to keep on just going around and around like that. I think that's perfect. Yeah. It it can work. It can work. That's the exciting part. Okay. And I don't think older men do that. <laughs> that's that's the other thing with older, older men. Um so dating websites. Have you been on one? Have you thought about doing that? Have you are you on one? No. Um, have you been on one? I I have been in and out of maybe a minor I don't even I haven't been on any of the major dating sites. It's kind of silly for me to go on any type of a dating website. How else are you? Because you're constantly working. How are you? Oh, you're going to meet a woman in the hall because she just got divorced. Um, uh, <laughs> that's well, where you're going to meet your people. <laughs> that's, a, that's, always a, a, that's always a reasonable possibility. <laughs> but but I seriously, used to say, outside of that, how are you meeting people? Because you're working all day, you're working all night, you're bringing your work home. I, I, I have the... I've had an attitude for a long time because in my adult life until about a dozen years ago, I've either been married or dating to get married because that's what I like. That's who I think I am. In the last 10 or 12 years, God has really taken me out of that realm. Not that I don't want it, but he's just kept that pretty much away from me. And so my comment used to be, if God wants me to get married, he's going to have somebody ring my doorbell. <laughs> You know, that happened once. Pizza. Uh, and I, you know, that happened <laughs> once. And she has a car it. and a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can read about myself as one of those guys. Then you give them a ten thousand dollar tip, and they keep coming back. So. Okay, so let's let's talk about money because if you did have a profile, we talked about this, and you liking younger women. If you didn't want somebody to like you for your money, then you would just put your profile up and you would say, I'm interested in dating women that are 16, you know, 15 years younger. Then you would be like a creeper. But then if you would put that you're worth $25 million and looking for a woman that is 15 years younger, then the game totally changes. There's a, there's a video out there. I think it's a book, but it's a video. And it's called The Law of Attraction. Mm -hmm. And I had a client give it to me okay. because he thought it was amusing and true and i watched it for about 15 20 minutes and i couldn't stand it but, okay. but but there was a very interesting part of it and they brought out like five women and they had posters with pictures of five different guys and at the bottom of the poster they had what they did for a living what their annual salary was what they liked to do you know what their extracurricular activities were so they had a profile below the pictures and and so there was one of the pictures was a guy that if you guys are old enough to know who Alfred E. Newman is from Mad Magazine, the guy wasn't the most attractive human being in the world. And yet he was a corporate executive. He made $250,000 a God, year. Ladies. He liked to skydive and ski boat race and go to sporting events and all the wonderful things that are attractive. And these five women rated him an average of eight out of 10. Wow. Okay. 
So, and, and there was a good looking guy who was a store manager for McDonald's, made $36,000 a year, you know, liked to stay home and play video games. We're not plugging McDonald's. Yeah, no, I <laughs> <laughs> Unless they want us. Unless they want us, exactly. And so and we are open to and, that. <laughs> and, and that person got like a five. So then they send those. It was four, hot. Yeah, and they send those five Damn, women out, <laughs> and they for you, and they they bring in five new okay. women. I'll take I'll take the McDonald's guy. <laughs> anytime. So they bring in five new women, and they change and the same five pictures, the same five guys, only they change their profiles. And Alfred E. Newman is now the uh -huh. store uh -huh. manager and makes $36,000 a year and likes to stay home and play video uh -huh. games. And his rating was a four. Right. So all you did was you didn't change his picture. You just changed his profile mm -hmm. and he goes from an eight to a four. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty telling. <laughs> so the thing about older men and that is what I don't like is that it's their world and I think that younger men are more open to sharing the world and you building something with them versus walking into a world where you have to be there for somebody on every you know call that they have for you or demand or request might be true and might not be well <laughs> that's all I'm saying I want to build with somebody and I think walking in, and maybe that's just something inside of me where I'm just, I'm that independent where I, I, um, I, I don't want anybody to, to have any kind of power over me like that, that I just, I want to be equal. If I had those um, five profiles in front of me, I would probably pick, uh, I would go by looks first. I wouldn't care what they made. And if they did the reverse, and, and if they, they really, had, if they had faith, that would be the other. That should be the third other way around. But yeah, faith. Yeah. And if they did it the other way around, and they put five guys out there, and they put five pictures of five women, you wouldn't have to put a profile. No, because, because every the, guy would pick the the hot chick. The hot chick. Okay, because you also told me. Can you? Are you surprised that I remembered everything that we talked about? Yeah, I have to learn to keep. How my long mouth have we known each other you? for? Like a year, right? <laughs> And this is based off of our first conversation. I knew then, I was like, this is going to be a fun interview. You said that she doesn't have to be smart. She can just be pretty and you'd be happy. I, I think that I probably <laughs> overstated my case a little bit. Okay. Because there has to be some, you have to be able to carry on some type uh -huh. of a communication with the other person. But I do think that in ranking priorities, uh -huh. that would not be number one, would be the art of communication. So you want, but you want a, you want a good look and what you like beautiful women, that's what you want. Well, I, you know, by beautiful woman, I want somebody that's, that's attractive to me that gets me wanting to do the things that Chaser. I think as a husband I should do. And if somebody is not particularly attractive to me, it's really hard to, Make chasing. everything else, you know, work the way it's supposed to work. That but just fun. remember that beauty is always in the eyes of the beholder. So when you Absolutely. say a beautiful woman, Absolutely. you talk to a lot of guys who you and I might not think they're, or women, and you may not think that their spouse is particularly attractive and they see them as awesome. And well, I think yeah. that is amazing and terrific. Ultimately, that connection that you have with that person and you see them and they see you and Nobody else sees them the way that you see them is probably true. Yes. But that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Yeah. I think that's the way it should be. Marriage would have to rethink again. I think. Well, I don't do know. Just, I guess it just scares me. I don't want to screw it up. Just do me a favor and don't take your Bible <laughs> and tear out those pages that tell you that if you're going to be in that kind of a relationship, you need to be married. I, um, Somebody asked gosh, me. Gosh, so I'm about tell that. You, I'm like, I'm a, it's I'm about love and not marriage for me. But I would you, marry again, I guess. I, I had a client, and I went to his place of business one day, and his son was kind of his number two guy. And his son was in his probably late 30s, and he'd been with a, a gal for seven or eight years, mm -hmm. and they had no interest in having children. And they had what they described as a, just a great relationship. 
and people, some people were suggesting that they ought to get married. And so when I came in, he buttonholes me and he drags me into his office and he said, eh, and tells me the story and he says, uh, do you think we should get married? And, and I will tell you, I believe that this was before my conversion days. Mm -hmm. Before Christ. Yes. And, and I said, yes. And he said, why? We, we, have, we have a great relationship. We're not going to have children. Why do we need to get married? And I said, because during the course of your relationship, you're going to have ups and downs. And if you're not married, it's too easy to go in the closet, grab your suitcase, throw your clothes in it, and walk out the door. You've got nothing in particular to tie you to this other person. And when you're married, even though some people may talk about it as a piece of paper, there's an exercise that you're going to have to go through to get divorced. And if it doesn't get you to think about whether you really want to go there, then something's wrong. But can it be the opposite where you walk into the closet and grab your suitcase and be like, I am so glad I did not marry that person because but, it is done and we don't have to go through all of that. And the answer is no. By Felicia. The answer is no. And no, because you walk out at, a, at the trough of your relationship and you don't give it the opportunity for the trough to become a, a wave at the top. You're all going to go through, all of us are going to go through, all of us have been through tough times in relationships, whether you're married or whether you're not. I mean, the truth is that we probably all would have kicked our children out of our house if that was the attitude that we have. The minute things are bad and they, <laughs> and they call us names and tell us how much they hate us, mm -hmm. we ought to just get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Give them away. Give them to the state. Put them out on the street. Send them to a home. <laughs> okay? But we don't do that. And we shouldn't do that in a relationship. We need to work through the tough times. When you work through the tough times, sometimes you come out the other end better, stronger, mm -hmm. happier, more alive. And if when you hit the trough, you walk out the door, you don't have that opportunity. Well, the marriage certificate keeps you in that agreement where I think relationships, people want that. I think people really do want to experience that, but they're, they're questioning what the other person is going to do. And I think, again, ego comes into play. But... Um, it's some, I would love to experience that where you just hold on no matter what and nobody's going anywhere and you're going to figure it out because you're going to get through it yeah. and then there's going to be, you know, good times. Again, half, half or all of that is up to you. Mm -hmm. I'm good now. I think I'm good now. I think I've learned a lot about love. I'm good for love now. I do believe I am. I've worked on myself and... As everybody should, I think the difference is, is I really started, um, I've always loved myself, but I, I think uh, I took that, I, I'm taking that more serious now. It is true that you can't love anybody unless you love yourself. And I don't think a lot of people out there know how to love themselves and know how to be comfortable spending time by themselves and not having the engagement. I think people have the confidence and security in a relationship and and have that be where they think they're experiencing this love and it's a false sense of security because if you don't have it for yourself and I think that you love differently and choose differently and live differently when you love yourself completely and you get that like you really get that yeah, how it's cemented how many people really sit there and think about loving themselves? They I don't. don't know That's that why I, I'm bringing it up. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever sat in my closet and just contemplated, do I really love myself? Well, I mean, you wouldn't put up with a lot of shit if you did. You know, there's relationships out there that they're putting up with stuff where they're sacrificing and settling or, you know, trying to make something work where they think that they're going to receive love to this other person when if you really did love yourself, you wouldn't put up with half of the shit that you're putting up with, chances are. Well, Don't I you agree with that? 
Yeah, I would agree with that. But most of that comes from your childhood and what you observed uh-huh. in either, we all have that. either your parental relationship uh-huh. or another close relationship. Some people have relationships with grandparents or with friends that actually transcend their relationship with their parents when mm-hmm. the parental relationship yep. is dysfunctional. So you have role models that are great that don't have to be your parents. It should be your parents, but it doesn't have to be. Thank God for grandmas and grandmas. You, you bet. Grandpas and grandpas. Um, one more thing before I ask you every guest three questions, but before we get to that, I was told once that a man at the age of 40, this was by another divorce lawyer, said that a man by the age, a man by the age of 40 has established everything that he will have in life for the most part, with the exception of some that may win the lottery or go on and have this, you know, freak success. Is that true? Well, can you say that? Like men that are 40 well, have established what they're going to establish in life. So that means women out there, what, if your man is 40, is that true? No, but, but, there's, but there is a lot of truth. That in really that. stuck. Yeah, because um, by the time we're 40, we have generally been in uh, whatever our career choice has been now for 15 plus or minus years. And by 15 years into a job or a profession, you generally are what you're going to be. Um, Does it apply for women or was he just saying that about men? You know, it's hard for me to say the same thing about women because, and and this sounds sexist and I am anything but that, and so I don't want you to take it this way. You're anonymous. Yeah, is that... um, Women can fulfill a role as a mother and as a wife that doesn't involve a business career. And, and so a woman can be 40 years old and have raised three children who are now teenagers uh, and have a very, very fulfilled life. It doesn't mean that that's all they're ever going to be. So for women, I think it's different than for guys. Now, if a woman is in a career and career oriented, then yeah, by the time she's been doing what she's doing, been doing for 15 years, she ought to be about where she's going to be with just upside and not much downside. Personally, by the time I was 40, I was reasonably well established. Um, When do men start slowing down? (laughs) I work harder at my age today than I did 47 years ago. Okay, typically, so, when do men start slowing down? In today's world, probably not until their 70s. Really? I think, yeah, I think it's just totally different today. We're, we, we work until we're, I mean, I can't see myself ever really retiring. I may be forced into it for whatever reasons may happen, but I, I can't see ever wanting to quit. I mean, but part of that is my... Purpose and drive my, my and passion purpose and, and all that stuff. And, and who my boss is today and what he does for me <laughs> God. And, and who he sends me, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I may be slightly different in that world than others that are, whose lives aren't devoted to Christ and to God and, and believing that they send me the people that they send me. And so... I want to keep doing what I'm doing because I'm serving him by serving the people that he sends me. So it's purpose. So when men have purpose, they keep on going versus men that probably don't or people that don't have purpose or find that they have purpose. Yes. They slow down and kind of give up. When well, it's natural. I mean, do, do I? That keeps you alive, doesn't it? Yeah. Keeps it, you on fire. <laughs> would it be nice to not have to take work home every night and to be able to take a vacation without... Just go home and focus Without on the kids case? and the wife. Yeah, yeah. But, but until God, she needs that. Until God makes that part of my life, as long as He sends me the people and He sends me the work and expects me to use the skills that He's given me long before I knew who He was, then that's what I need to do. And it doesn't matter how many hours a day I work, as long as it's purposeful. 
Um, I want to touch on this quickly because you brought it up, and I'm surprised that I didn't ask it earlier. Uh, women that stay home and take care of the children and don't work and raise, you know, housewives. What would you say out there to men that may not see that as a important, vital role? Because they're out there. They think that they're just... It's the most important job in the world. I mean... Give her some credit, because I could... <laughs> If you really, if you really think about it, and you want to have healthy, well-adjusted children that are going to go out into this world and make a difference, uh, and be kind and loving, and the things that we want our children to be, if your wife is working eight hours a day, and your kids come home and go to daycare, and or when they're old enough, come home and are by themselves in the house, you're you're never going to produce the type of world that we really need to produce. And I know there's a lot of women out there that will find what I'm about to say is horrifying. And that is that I really believe that, that that's the role that God designed for women and that our world is a better place when women are raising full-time our children. So you're saying that the children that you're raising are much better people and when they're raised, when their mom's at home? My mom was a stay-at-home mom, at least until my dad died and my youngest brother was old enough to stay home and she had to go to work. But uh, there's three of us and we all have some degree of success and um, confidence of the nurturing and all of those things that happen and goodness and try to make other people's lives better because you're not feel perfect loved. but I think because my mom was at home when we came home she was there when we came home for lunch she was there when we came home after school and I just think that that I don't know what it would have been like if my life was different and my mom worked and I had to take care of myself. What would you say to the women out there that are doing that? Uh, it's a thankless job. It's not a thankless job. You don't? It's not, you don't think so? It's anything but a thankless job. It is as it should be the most rewarding job in the world. It should be. Women that do that should um, be honored and be respected, um, be applauded be rewarded um, because they will produce uh, children uh, that will make this world a better place. You and your wife, did she work? She did not. My first wife did, my second did not. So, and quite frankly, I would have been happy if my first wife never worked. And I was perfectly happy and fine that my second wife didn't work. I wanted her to be home taking care of the children. I made enough money to pay the bills and give us a reasonable lifestyle. And I didn't need her to go out and do anything other than what I thought was important. And that is to be there for the children 24-7. And you stopped chasing her. Yes. My fault. It happens. That's real. I know. I, I, and, and I apologize to her and anybody else that will listen for my attitude for all those years. I think people are learning from this, listening to this. I'm learning. I'm learning I need to keep my mouth shut when it comes to my... <laughs> <laughs> There, there, there is a biblical thing that I'm says in a, don't I'm in say a anything wonderful else. relationship right now that I think that is what I've always hoped love could be. Well, now you know how to make it work. Yeah, I'll make him chase my ass all <laughs> over this town. <laughs> no, I chase him, trust me. <laughs> 
Okay, three questions that I ask every single uh, guest is, what is the love? Where's the love in your story? Well, we didn't really spend much time on it, but uh, the love in my story is um, God having shown up in my living room and led me to a life with him and Christ at age 56 so that I understand where everything I have came from, where everything I'm going to get, if anything, going forward comes from, and that what my purpose is in terms of my profession, and that's a whole other story about how I even became a lawyer before I even right, knew Because you were going to be was. an engineer. I was going to be an electrical engineer, and that's a that's a whole story that I can look back and say, God had a plan for me long before I ever knew who he was. What kind of person were you before you met, before you accepted Christ and had this experience? Not a lot different than what you see on the surface. I mean, I... I generally tried to do the right thing, although, again, my marriages failed in large part because of me. And Did you hold on to your marriages because of, well, you didn't have God in your no. life to even have that in no. your... By the time he came into my life, my second marriage was pretty much in the garbage can. So, um, so but but anyway... My purpose and my boss and what I do, I do because he loves me and it allows me to show the people that come through my office, I think, something different than you would expect from a lawyer and that I would have done for the first 30 years of my practice. Are you a better lawyer as a Christian or are you a selfie? I'm a, am I a better lawyer? I think my skills are the same. Um, I think that um, my clients are better served because they get something more than just my legal reasoning and my ability to show up in the courtroom and try a lawsuit. They get, hopefully they see something that reflects uh, kind of where I've been and who I am today and they can see God and Christ in what I do without me having to use those names and those terms. Mm -hmm. So right. there's a sense of peace mm -hmm. that I think we can give to somebody when we have a belief system that makes us peaceful. Where is or what is the lie? <laughs> In everything I've said today, there is none. There really is none. I think I've communicated from the heart what I think, and the words that come out of my mouth really aren't my words. You know, they come from someplace above. I'm not smart enough to say everything that comes out of my mouth. So I don't think there's a lie. I think if there's a lie in, the, in, in this, it, it really comes from what everybody else wants us to believe this world's about. You know, if it doesn't, if it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. If you're not happy, get out. Those are the lies. Mm -hmm. Those are absolute and utter lies. So if I've been able to communicate that in some way in the midst of everything else I've said, then I want to make sure that people understand that those are the lies that this world teaches us and tells us. So if somebody is in the middle of a divorce right now, they can stop and really think to themselves, what are you thinking right now? Because a lot of negative thoughts come through that you're saying are not from a place of love and light, and they control our actions and choices. And, and um, you're saying just be conscious of what you're thinking. Give it some thought, recognize um, the effect that it has on you, on your spouse, on your children, on, quite frankly, all those people around you. And I think if you can give it some thought and try and work on it, doesn't mean it's going to succeed. I'm not saying every marriage 
needs to stay together forever. That's not what I'm saying. That's not my point. I just think people need to give it more thought and more work and counseling if it's appropriate um, before they just get up and walk away. And what is the truth? The truth. The truth is that God sits on the throne. That um, he shows us the path, shows us what love really is, because you talked about what love is. And I think he's the model for what true love is. Yes. And I think if we can see that, that, um, that we will love like he loves us. So that's the truth. So not all lawyers are money hungry. I don't think all lawyers are money hungry. There are some that work for nothing. There are some that uh, work to do the right thing, regardless of whether or not we get paid for what we do. And I don't want to be judgmental about all lawyers, but unfortunately the norm is that it's a business and it's really more than a business. Oh, there we have it. There you have it. Thank you for letting me interview you. You're welcome. Did you have a good time? I had a good time. Were you surprised that I remembered? Oh, I've been trembling for the past few, <laughs> waiting, waiting for this day. <laughs> No, it's easy. Oh. It's easy. As long as we say what's on our heart and speak the truth, it's that we have nothing to hide and nothing to fear. That's right. That's what it's all about. In your answers, the interview was just awesome. I think a lot of people have a lot to think about. And you know what? I wouldn't be surprised because people message me, email me about they've heard an episode and how it's changed their lives. And... I wouldn't be surprised if this is just one of those magical episodes that do exactly that. As long as when they say that, they're looking up and not at me. Right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. The Truth by Abel. Abel. <laughs> I am Abel. <laughs> All right. Thank <laughs> you.